my dudes, my name is Tiffany. Welcome back to my series, Internet Analysis, where I like to research and discuss things relevant to social issues and media. Today's topic is the wedding industry. Nathan and I are currently planning our own wedding, and throughout this process, it's been very fascinating to learn more about wedding costs, customs, and traditions. So I figured this would be a great topic to explore. After we got engaged, we went back and forth wondering whether we really wanted a whole wedding, but to us, especially because our families live so far apart and haven't met yet. Bringing everyone together for one big celebration sounds very special. We are trying to keep costs down and the wedding will be relatively small, but I still fully acknowledge that it is pretty wild to spend this much money on one day. Every time I remember that, it hurts. We're gonna discuss a lot in this video, but first I just wanna talk about our general wedding philosophy for context. Basically, we just want our loved ones to come together to have a good time. It's really important that the guests don't experience too much pressure, stress, or or expense. I would love to rent, reduce, reuse as much as possible for budget and waste sake. I want it to be kind of chill, not too formal or structured, just easy breezy. <laughs> I'm sure everyone who works in the wedding industry is laughing right now. I know. We've also been questioning a lot of the traditions and norms because we really want our wedding to reflect us, not just be what others expect it to be. While weddings can be celebrations of love, they can also be extremely capitalist performances of patriarchal traditions. Nearly all wedding traditions are nothing but pointless and expensive displays of wealth. I'm not going to get too deep into the traditions and history in this video, but I actually will be chatting more about it in my bonus video on my Patreon if you would like to check that out. And just a note before we get started, there's obviously going to be some personal, cultural, and religious differences in the weddings that I'm discussing in this video versus what is traditional or typical for you. Many cultures celebrate marriage with opulent weddings with tons of guests or have a traditional dress style that's inherently expensive. And some of these traditions hold significant cultural and religious importance, and sometimes deviating from these traditions can be seen as disrespectful, bad luck, etc. Basically what I'm trying to say is there is a lot of privilege in being able to say, fuck traditions. I know others aren't in that position and have much more family or cultural pressure to conform. So today I'm gonna be sharing many of my personal opinions, but I don't want this to come across as like a judgmental video. People have different tastes, different values, you can spend your money on whatever you prefer. But most of all, I just want us all to collectively question these traditions, standards, the media narratives about weddings, and ultimately figure out what you and your partner really want. And that might not involve marriage or a wedding at all. So let's jump in. First of all, to state the very obvious, weddings are expensive. I asked my Instagram followers their general thoughts about weddings, and many of the responses reflected this. People said things like, should we even be having weddings? Aren't they just a waste of money? Love a courthouse wedding, an elopement, a backyard wedding. If I had a backyard or someone's that we could have used, I would have loved to do that. So I totally understand responses like those. When looking at the traditional American wedding, we have the venue, the flowers, the cake, the decor, the dress or tux, the catering, photography, rentals, rings, I'm getting out of breath just listing all the details. And all of these things are not cheap. Over the last decade, we've seen the average American wedding cost around $30,000. And due to the pandemic in the last few years, we have seen smaller weddings and a lower average cost closer to $22,000. But let's put our math caps on for a second, something I don't do very often. The average cost of a wedding is very different from the median. The average gets skewed by the extremely expensive, outlier weddings, while the median can be a lot more accurate in showing what a typical couple spends. This article makes some great points about the methodology of those wedding statistics, plus the fact that sites like The Knot are basically giant ads for promoting massive expensive weddings. We often hear that the average cost of a wedding is about $30,000, but actually the median has ranged from fifteen dollars to $20,000 in the last decade. I wonder if promoting that higher average figure makes couples believe that that is the normal amount they should spend. Don't worry if $30,000 seems a little out of budget. It must cost that much to have a decent wedding. You can swing it. The narrative of the quote unquote average cost helps to sell a more expensive experience. I think we have an idea that spending less than the average means that the wedding itself will inherently be 
below average. And you don't want your wedding to seem cheap or inadequate. It's all very fascinating. Before we continue, let's give a shout out to the sponsor of this portion of today's video, friend of the channel, ThreadUp. ThreadUp is a massive online consignment and thrift store and one of my absolute favorite places to shop. I always try to shop secondhand first, look for some pre-loved goodies. So I keep things on a wish list that I'm keeping an eye out for and then I can easily search for them on ThreadUp, which I love, find my exact size. If I want a specific brand or specific color, it is just so easy. I'm excited to show you what I got and we will start with this dress, which is from French Connection. Estimated retail price was $119. I got it on ThreadUp for $28.99. It is a wrap dress, which is my absolute favorite style of dress because what fits better than a wrap dress? This is just so comfy, easy to throw on. I might end up hemming it just a touch, show a little knee, and it has butterflies all over it. They also kind of look like cat ears, I've been told. <laughs> Next, I've got this white bodysuit from BP, and I love to pair it with this sheer black top, which is from Elizabeth and James. It's super breathable and lightweight, which is obviously perfect for summer. I've been wearing it casually like this, and also as a little bathing suit cover-up, going to the pool, perfect. Then we've got a solid basic, honestly need them, love them. This shirt is from Babaton. It just goes with everything. I can wear it with shorts. I can dress it up. It's so soft and comfy. I mean, do I have to convince you of the wonders of a basic tee? Come on. Then we have this cutie little crop top. This is from Topshop. Just a cropped Topshop top. Again, it goes with everything. It's got the cutie little lettuce hem. And I've currently got it paired with my favorite little pair of trousers. This outfit makes me feel like I should ride bikes and go have the summer of my childhood dreams. Except now I'm in my mid-twenties. Even better. And this magical dress. I feel like a fairy princess. It's new with tags. And this is from the brand Esom. Estimated retail was $48. I got it on ThreadUp for $25.99. What can I say? It's extremely maxi. <laughs> Might need a touch of hemming from me, but I love an easy breezy summer dress. I've said it a million times and I'll say it again. This is so cute. I wanna be on the beach. I wanna be having a picnic. So next time you need to do a little clothes shopping, I highly recommend checking out ThreadUp. You all can get 30% off your very first order with my code and link in the description, and you'll also get free shipping. Thank you so much, ThreadUp. Now let's get back into it. Weddings are sold to us as the most expensive event you'll ever have. We know to expect increased costs due to the so-called wedding tax. Basically, when you pay more for the same or similar service due to the increased stress, pressure, and expectations for a wedding versus a more casual event. Plus, we see flashy weddings displayed all over social media and traditional media, making it seem like opulence is the only option. Because this is a once-in-a-lifetime fairy tale celebration of your love, people are willing to spend a ton of money to make that dream a reality and even go into debt for it. In the US, 28% of couples reported going into debt when paying for their weddings. That's insane. Well, this culture of spending is now so pervasive, if you don't do it, your family will be pissed. Murph, where are the floral centerpieces? You can't have a wedding without floral centerpieces. Mom, they were two grand extra. You're breaking your mother's heart. Tell Ashley to put it on the Discover. This reminds me of the show Marriage or Mortgage. Your wedding can be one of the first major financial decisions you make as a couple, and potentially making the wrong choice could lead to debt or big problems down the line if you don't share financial values. And we know financial stress can be a big factor of conflict in a long-term relationship. We want a house. I mean, that's the smart decision to make. But Evan, you can just say, just I, say, know, just I let want, it out. I want our wedding to be the best wedding of all the ones that we've been to. <clears throat> the show also represents that moment of questioning, wait, do we even want a wedding in this economy? But the real estate market is terrible too, and it's only gonna get worse. It is pretty wild that this is even a consideration. Would you rather have a mortgage and a house to call your own, or spend your entire nest egg on one very expensive day? As I watch, I'm like, mortgage, pick mortgage every time. Yet here I am planning a wedding. I am a walking contradiction. Why are we all so willing to spend so much on a wedding? Why does it have such a hold? Let's try to unpack that. Before we dive into this next section, a lot of the things 
things I'll be mentioning here and in this video focus more on the heterosexual or heteronormative couples experience. And because a lot of these traditions in the US involve traditional family values, aka conservative religious values, and patriarchal relationship dynamics, I just want to acknowledge that LGBTQ plus couples and others who fall outside these strict norms face even more judgment and pressure. So by now we have established again that weddings in the US are very expensive. But what about everything else that comes before or after? Honestly, there are a lot more events than I even knew about when I first Googled, how do I start planning my wedding? You've got to have an engagement party, a bridal shower, your bachelor bachelorette parties slash trips, rehearsal dinner, the actual wedding, and then maybe an extra post-wedding brunch. Oh wow, if you are already having an expensive fairy tale perfect day, why do you need an entire events calendar leading up to it? First things first, of course, we love to celebrate the people we love. It's fun to bring your friends, family, acquaintances all together to celebrate you in this very special moment. But still, isn't that what the wedding is for? Why do we need all of these mini celebrations on top of the big major one? My co-writer Sheridan and I came up with this theory, hypothesis. I know people get touchy about that. <laughs> it's all about community buy-in. When we were writing this script, one of the things that popped into our heads was how the calendar of social events leading up to a wedding feels very formal and performative and a little old fashioned. That tangent led us to talk about Bridgerton. The whole premise of the show is yes, about finding a perfect pairing and getting married, but it's more about the social performance and all of the events that go into convincing the ton that you're a good couple, plus celebrating the sweet, sweet satisfaction of a match. And like in the show, there is something to us about all these modern events feeling like proof of investment in the couple. Stay with me. In going to all these extra parties and brunches and celebrations, you are now a part of this couple's love story and the support system for this union. The more build up, the more photos, the more impactful the wedding feels. The community buy-in. If we're all investing this much time and money, there's obviously more commitment in this relationship than say a couple that had a more casual wedding, right? Without all the pomp and circumstance of bringing your relationship into society, is it even really that important to you? There is a weird narrative about casual weddings feeling less legitimate or respectable than bigger, showier weddings. The Vegas or courthouse wedding is shown in media to be a spontaneous, we don't care kind of vibe that will certainly end in a swift breakup because you didn't follow the norms of a typical wedding. You didn't put in enough time, thought, and financial investment into the event, which clearly makes it easier to break up because you're not bound by money or community buy-in. Obviously, all of this is not true, and it's shitty to assume that intimate or private or more spontaneous weddings are any less loving, legitimate, or serious. Especially in the past few years, I think we've all been realizing things about what is truly important to us. On one hand, I think people think of weddings and parties as too frivolous. There are so many more important things going on. But on the other hand, because the world is so chaotic, it feels right to finally take some time to celebrate. Dare I say, let's fucking party. Anyway, again, I'm gonna chat more about those pre-wedding events in my Patreon bonus video. If you wanna hear more about my personal opinions about which events we have opted into. Now let's get into all of the wedding media that encourages us to go big and spend more. I want to discuss the cultural influence from advertising, movies, TV shows, and social media. Like with all marketing ploys, advertising for everything from engagement rings to wedding dresses sells us the same narrative. If you don't buy X things and spend X amounts, your wedding, marriage, relationship, entire life is going to be a disaster because diamonds are forever. And this marketing mentality extends into our own personal brands via social media. Because we live in a society, we feel pressure to meet others' expectations. We seek to emulate the perfection found in wedding pictures and videos. If my partner doesn't stop like that during our first look, it is over. It's a social performance. Like in many other aspects of life, our social media feeds a lot of comparison. Of course, big fancy weddings have always existed in order to encourage compliments of great taste. We want to leave an impression. So in writing this, I've been thinking a lot about like how big of a role does social media play in how people design their weddings? And I'm wondering this with myself as well as I'm making my 
design choices. How much of modern weddings are all about catering to what will look best on camera? And I want to compare this to Coachella. Basically, we all know how Coachella for influencers is basically a content farm for them to curate their best outfits and take endless photos of them having the time of their lives. I think that weddings serve as a content farm moment for many regular folks. Influencers are constantly going to cool events and taking great photos, but for normies who are not influencers, their wedding may be the most photogenic event that they ever attend. And they get to have their best dress moment with professional hair and makeup. I get it, while you look that good, of course you want to ensure that you have endless top tier photo content to post for years to come. Of course we all want to get some great photos, I certainly will. But from the research I've done and the social media content I've seen, some weddings seem to exist for the sole purpose of capturing photos instead of just capturing the moments of you actually enjoying your wedding. But hey, if you want to spend that much money setting up what is basically an elaborate backdrop for your wonderful, gorgeous pictures, be my guest. I'll be your guest at your wonderful, beautiful wedding. I'll be in the back eating the uh, vegan food. But anyway, it's understandable because wedding photos are often seen as some of the most important pictures in your lifetime. You might keep them on display forever or your descendants will hang them as family heirlooms so they can say, wow, look at how hot my great grandma was. And here I am for the second day of filming this video. Since you're this far in, I bet you care to hear a little bit of behind the scenes, so here we go. When I filmed that first part, I thought that this would be one whole video, maybe a little long, but the script was just way too much. So here I am finishing up this section, but this will probably end up being a two-parter. And I moved some things in the script around, so part two will focus on wedding reality shows because I want to use those as the lens to view, again, the cultural narratives about weddings. So that video should be coming in the next few weeks. If you have any last minute suggestions of reality TV shows regarding weddings that I should look into, let me know. But anyway, we have spent this whole video pretty much talking about how expensive weddings are, and now I wanna talk about the scale of weddings in terms of size. Ziad wanted a really, really small wedding, and I like big weddings, so we compromised and ended up with a number of uh, 600 attendees. Just personally, like, I am not close enough with enough people, and I don't think anyone is really capable of being close with, like, a hundred plus people, but between, you know, you and your partner, maybe there are that many people in your life, or, as I'm very well aware, other cultures, other religions tend to put a lot more emphasis on large weddings, like, you have to invite everyone in your entire family, all the cousins, your mom's friends. It's a very strange feeling to start writing a wedding guest list because it really does feel like working on your MySpace top eight again. Very millennial reference there. But like, it's not often in your life that you have to kind of rank the people that you love, like most important, gotta have them, um, the next tier of friends and family, and then the, that other tier of like, people that you know and maybe love on some level, but you don't really need them at your wedding. You know what I mean? But aside from my own opinions on the size of weddings, that's ideal. I hypothesize that the trend of having larger weddings is what is leading to more wedding burnout and an overall more cynical view of weddings in the culture. In the culture. I saw some TikToks. <laughs> Basically, the not posted a TikTok about guess most common complaints about weddings or their least favorite parts about weddings. And a lot of those were frankly the, you know, patriarchal traditional things that can either be a little uncomfortable or just a little eh, outdated maybe. Then I saw more TikToks of other brides responding and a lot of them said they thought those guests were being ungrateful or basically if you don't like weddings and wedding traditions, don't come. But the thing is, um, you actually invited them, so then they are probably going to attend to support you and your union, but they're not allowed to have opinions about the wedding, the event that they're attending. I do understand the bride's frustrations in these situations. You obviously put a lot of time, effort, and money into your wedding, and the last thing you'd want to hear is people being like, man, the food sucked, man, the DJ didn't like the garter toss. But also, I strongly believe that, first of all, guests are entitled to <laughs> sharing their opinions if they want. And also, these are just responses to a survey. It's not like these guests specifically went up to the couple and told them their complaints, though maybe some people do. But it's like, they're not even allowed to uh, anonymously complain. <laughs> do guests have rights? And more importantly, I can understand the fatigue of being a frequent wedding guest. 
So here's my whole thing again. With larger weddings being common, each couple invites more people and therefore guests are probably invited to more weddings per year. Instead of maybe attending one to two weddings a year of people that you're quite close to, someone might get invited to upwards of 10 or more weddings in a year to celebrate distant cousins, coworkers that you don't really hang out with, or you go as a plus one to a wedding for someone that you don't even know. And this was my thought while I was watching those TikToks about the complaints was like, if I were at the wedding of one of my best friends, I would be loving all the speeches. I would love watching the first dance, precious. However, if I imagine I am at my eighth wedding of the summer, God, back-to-back -back weddings, make it stop. The person getting married is my partner's brother's coworker. We don't know anyone there. We just listen to an hour of speeches full of inside jokes. At that point, I'm gonna be tired. I am going to be picky. I am going to be very much judging the bar and the food. Are there good vegan options? If there aren't, I'm starving, I'm angry. I'm gonna be a little more picky about what that DJ is playing. So again, being invited to a wedding is great. It's an honor, allegedly. And I think guests do all appreciate that that couple and their family is spending a lot of money per person in order order to have that wedding. But still, the couple should appreciate that attending a wedding is also very expensive. To be a guest at a wedding, you might need to take time off of work. Then you've got the cost of travel, accommodations. Don't forget to buy a gift from the couple's registry. On average, that costs $127 from family members and $99 for all other guests. Then as guests, we feel pressure to wear something new and exciting to every wedding. Even if you're the type of person who has a go-to wedding dress, you've still got to fit the weather, maybe the theme, and maybe the wedding dress code. If you're getting invited to multiple weddings a year and you have to buy a new dress for every occasion, that gets pricey. This is why I think shopping secondhand is great. Maybe renting a dress for a special occasion is a great way to go. Or maybe create your capsule of like two to three go-to occasion outfits that work for like any dress code. But then you've still got to overcome the fear of outfit repeating, which we all need to work on. That's a great skill. Be a proud outfit repeater. So again, couples need to appreciate that yes, they are spending a lot on their own wedding, but their guests are all investing a fair bit of time, energy, and money to be there as well. And it's even more of an investment for the wedding party, especially the bridesmaids. In recent decades, it has been the norm for all of the bridesmaids to wear the exact same dress as chosen by the bride. These days, it's a little more common for the bride to pick a specific color or a style, but give the bridesmaids a little bit more room for personalization. And it is customary for the bridesmaids to pay for their own dresses, plus the cost of any alterations. All of this time and expense for a dress they will likely never wear again. Cue Katherine Heigl in 27 dresses. Now I might be talking more about this in my Patreon bonus video, but I don't really have an official wedding party. Again, we're still ironing out those details. But to me, it was really important again for my guests and my loved ones to not be completely stressed and overwhelmed in attending my wedding. So when I thought about like, do I want to invite my closest friends and family to be my bridesmaids? I was like, hmm, why? But it just blows my mind because there's so much more cost and responsibility that goes into being a bridesmaid. It's not just, oh cute, you get to stand next to the couple and look precious, though that is true. Especially a maid of honor. That's even more responsibility. You'll be helping the bride plan the wedding, plus the organization of other events like the bachelorette party. And you're gonna need cute outfits for all those other parties and events too, of course. Plus surprise, we're actually gonna have the bachelorette party be a destination trip, so add that to the tally as well. According to Refinery29, many bridesmaids spend over a thousand dollars on their friend's wedding. And I personally just think that's pretty unfair to ask of your friends. Some of your friends may easily be able to afford that and are happy to spend that money, but others might not be in the financial position to where they can spend $1,000 on your wedding. And ironically, these conflicts, especially about money and just not being considerate of your wedding party can ruin friendships. So to conclude, again, uh, as I mentioned, this video, this script has taken many forms since Sheridan and I started working on it. And Initially, I actually just wanted to focus on the waste 
angle of the wedding industry. You know, single use plastics, food and flowers going to waste, clothing only being worn once, which I think are still very important. Um, I'm definitely still considering a lot of those issues in planning our wedding. But as I was writing it, I think we found that these cultural narratives and the media angle tend to be the most interesting to me. But ultimately, what I've learned from researching this video is that there are so many external factors and pressures from media, family, and the wedding industry that encourage couples to go way outside their budgets and outside their comfort zones to fit a cultural narrative that this is the most important day of your life and bigger is always better. At the end of the day, what I'm trying to remind myself as Nathan and I continue planning is like, this is about us. It's about celebrating us as a couple and bringing our loved ones together, which is going to be the most precious experience. And it's going to be, that's going to be hopefully not a once in a lifetime thing, but definitely something that's not going to happen all the time because our friends and family live in different countries. I want to have a good time. I want to eat good vegan food. I want to listen to my favorite love songs. That is that. I hope this video made sense. Thanks. <laughs> that's how I end every single video. Hope it made sense. And today we do have a small channel shout out. Today's shout out goes to Ashley Norton. I found her in the algorithm a month or so ago and I immediately watched almost every video she had posted. <laughs> Ashley makes commentary videos and they're just so relaxing and I feel like she has a very wholesome presentation style, if that makes sense. And she's covered some great topics such as the rise and fall of the Brit crew. I've loved her unpacking the Click franchise video. She has a very kind series on Demi Lovato and her latest series recapping H2O. <laughs> These are just my go-to videos when I'm like making lunch, turn on an Ashley video, and it's just the best. Typically for small channel shoutouts, I try to stay under 10,000 subscribers and Ashley's at 13 currently. So this shoutout is less that she needs the algorithm boost because I think she's gonna continue to blow up. She is doing very well on her own, but as always, I just really like to share the channels that I'm enjoying and I think that a lot of you would also enjoy Ashley's content. I would love to give a shout out to my patrons. If you want to check out that bonus content like the video I'm going to be posting there this month. We also do a monthly live stream or if you just want to support the channel that would be wonderful. Extra thank yous to my executive producers including Uwu Face, Abby Hayden, Cassandra Toner, Eric Danielson, Freshly Laundered, Jaden C, Jackie King, Jill Hoffman, Joe Fernandez, Josh Woods, Julie Leva, Justin Landis, Casey Luck, Kristen Holloman, Kristen Manger, Marty Schmeichel, Matthew Gray, Megan Collins, Metcalf33, Nicole Louise, Online DBT Skills, Rebecca Goodson, Rohana Barden, Sarah Kemi, Stevie May, Tessa Thompson, and Tom Walker, Truffa, and VivianOladon.com. And once again, thank you to ThreadUp for kindly sponsoring today's video. You can get 30% off your first order and free shipping with my code and link in the description. Stay tuned for future internet analysis videos, and I will see you next time. Okay, thanks, bye!